vaccines test on Monday. Uh, I'm going to give you a few days to get it done, essentially. But uh, we want to finish up this chapter on political parties as fast as we can. Uh, we were talking about the party eras, a brief history of political parties. And we said that uh, you had the last thing we left off with was the New Deal era, where essentially Democrats are going to dominate from the 1930s, from the start of the Great Depression until 1968. And 1968 is the last of these what we call critical or realigning elections, where the, the groups on the uh, groups under the umbrella is kind of switch sides. OK, and 1968 uh, ends the era of Democratic dominance because of a couple of reasons. If you've forgotten, Lyndon Johnson is president in the 1960s and leading up to 1968, there were a lot of problems in America uh, that were very tumultuous and led people to become very frustrated with the Democratic Party. Okay, uh, there were a number of things. That, and remember, if there was any year before 2020 that was as tumultuous as, as this one, uh, it would be 1968. It's probably considered up until this year the worst year in American history for a number of reasons. Uh, we find out Lyndon Johnson and the Democratic Party have lied to us to get us more deeply involved in the Vietnam War. Uh, that is very problematic, to say the least. You have the civil rights movement that is going on, and uh, it's a time of serious upheaval. You have the hippie movement uh, of the 1960s as well, and young people changing that, the free speech movement. I mean, what else can you throw on the 1960s? There's so much turmoil uh, in this time period that people have had enough, and they're like, hey, uh, Democrats are the party in charge, and they're going to have to take responsibility, Okay. And so the democratic dominance ends, and we move into the last era, and it's called the era of divided government, right? Uh, and we call it the era of divided government because from 1968 until now, uh, we frequently have that divided government where one party controls the White House and the other party controls one or both houses of Congress, right? And it was always, almost always the opposite of that prior to. Usually whoever won the presidential election would win in congressional elections too. OK, but it's not that way. And, and also you see the White House trading hands very frequently between parties. OK, it's like a pendulum back and forth. It goes now uh, this time period is significant for a lot of reasons. Uh, the umbrella parties, uh, the Southerners, uh, which represent a huge voting bloc, Southerners after 1960s uh, switch from being traditionally Democrat to becoming more traditionally Republican. Right. Uh, they were frustrated with the civil rights movement. Imagine that. And they start voting Republican more frequently. And it's not that Republicans were like, let's bring back Jim Crow laws or racism. But they were like, hey, you, you got to leave this up to individual states to figure out. Uh, and Southerners kind of like that. All right. You see black people become more fully integrated with the Democratic Party, and they've been there ever since. Now, a reason that you see this divided government from 1968 until now is because people start to engage in what we call split ticket voting. Okay. Split ticket voting is when you like, when I get my, like I engage in split ticket voting where for some offices I will vote for the Republican and some offices I will vote for the Democrat. Um, and that happens very frequently uh, because people now realize you can't trust the political party wholesale. And they realize this about both parties. Like in 1968, you know, it was Lyndon Johnson and the Democrats who were messing things up in Vietnam and struggling to get things under control with civil rights and dealing with the hippie movement. But in the 70s, you had Richard Nixon and a whole lot of scandal there, and he messed up Vietnam pretty badly, too. OK, and so really what happens is people find out that you can't just trust the party. You have to look at individual candidates and consider, uh, you know, what's who's the right person to vote for? And so you see more split ticket voting. And that's why you may have a Republican controlled Congress, but a Democrat as the president. And like I said, that happens very frequently. Not at all unusual in this time period. All right. Split ticket voting was the norm for a while. Now, somebody brought this up to me the other day and they were asking about this. Uh, my concern is that people are going back to straight uh, ticket voting where they just say, I'm going to vote Republican because all Democrats are bad. Or they vote Democrat because they think all Republicans are bad. Uh, and I think that's a dangerous thing that uh, I like the idea of split ticket voting, that you should always pay attention to every single race on the ballot. Uh, and you may end up voting for like all Democrats or all Republicans, but pay attention to every race. OK, don't just give somebody your vote simply because they are 
uh, a party member. All right? And that's where we are now. And a lot of people want to look at 2020 as another one of these critical or realigning elections. And it's too early to tell uh, what's happening uh, with that. If any groups under the umbrellas are switching sides or starting to become uh, more predominantly Democrat or predominantly Republican. But that's what political scientists are trying to figure out. Have we hit this next realigning election? Okay. We want to talk real briefly to round out this chapter about the problems of political party. And one of the biggest uh, problems is the ideological makeup. Okay. And what we mean by that, remember, even though somebody has the label Democrat, they might be a very liberal Democrat, like far to the left, like bordering on socialism, socialism like a Bernie Sanders or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez type of Democrat. And then you get the Joe Manchin Democrats who are very more moderate, and sometimes socially their values look more conservative than anything else. Okay, And that's a bit of a problem because when you've got these groups, um, when you've got these groups within the party that don't always agree, it's hard to come up with good policy. Because even within the party itself, they're not sure what direction they want to go. Like, let's pretend for a moment that Democrats were able to win the Senate here in these runoff seats in Georgia, and they control the House, they control the Senate, and the White House. Okay, Even though it seems like they should be able to pass uh, whatever legislation they want to, uh, it's not going to be that easy because you have groups within the Democratic Party who disagree about how far they should be going. Um, you know, And I think an example we mentioned yesterday, like the Green New Deal, where people want to enact serious environmental restrictions, make changes about uh, pollutants and other uh, things we admit into the environment, and other people aren't ready to go that route yet. Okay, So this is a problem. Sometimes good policies get held up because of the makeup of the ideology within a single party, all right? and parties can't get things done. Okay, Now, the second problem that we have here is probably the more serious one or the most serious one of these major three. It's what we call party polarization. Even though parties are broken up into, uh, you know, like there's the more liberal Democrats and the more conservative Democrats, uh, here's a problem that develops here. This looks like mitosis or, or something in a science class. Uh, and if you zoom in a little bit, and I'll try to zoom in uh, for you here, I don't know if I can. Uh, but if you look at this, it goes back to 1949, and they show you the ideological divide between Democrats and Republicans, blue and red. And you can see that like, there's not exactly a whole, whole lot of difference in terms of uh, the, uh, like the, the blue and the red. Like there's the people who are scattered, like all your Democrats are scattered about, okay? whereas the, uh, you know, the Republicans are the same way. And you can see over time, though, that these camps of people, like you go down to the very bottom here in 2011, right? There's a huge divide between them. All the Democrats have been scooting more towards the left, and the Republicans have been scooting more towards the right. You don't get a lot of those middle ground people or the big, like if you just look at the Democrats or the Republicans, either or, okay? You get this, uh, like if you just look at the blue all the time, they're more spattered apart in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. But then in the 80s and 90s, look at all the blue, they're starting to get closer together. It's not as wide of a circle anymore. And this is what we call party polarization. When the parties become polarized, you start to become attracted towards the edges, okay? That uh, Democrats say, well, we think these policies are good and Republicans don't have any good ideas and we think you should vote for us because our policies are superior and that's just the way it is, All right? And Democrats and Republicans view the other side as an enemy, that they're too far apart from them to really be a true American, okay? Uh, and the, this is a problem because if you can't admit that the other side has made some successful policies, then that's a real problem. You think that you're always right on a particular issue and that your side is always right. Uh, it's a basic form of tribalism. My tribe is good and has all the right ways of doing things, and your tribe is bad and can't figure out how to do anything effectively. Right? And that takes us to a dangerous place where people get angry at one another just because they're different. All right? We can accept a lot of differences in uh, life, uh, talk about religion, culture, 
and we seem to do fine with that. But ideologically or politically, if you're not one of us, then you're one of them, and we don't like them, okay? And that's a big problem going forward for the future. Now, parties deal with uh, one of the problem they deal with, well, one of their set of problems they deal with is the same problems of interest groups. Uh, when James Madison in Federalist Number 10 talked about factions, uh, he was concerned that factions would have too much influence over government. Uh, and uh, he was talking about not just interest groups, but political parties as a whole. Uh, and he said, look, factions to him, he didn't make any distinction between an interest group and political party. And he said they care about what they care about and nothing else. All right. It doesn't matter if it's adverse to the interests of citizens as a whole. All right. And that's a very big problem to be that selfish about an issue. All right. And one of the big problems for both sides, uh, Democrats and Republicans, is oftentimes they think if something doesn't affect them directly, then it must not be an issue. OK. And let me give you two examples, one from each side of the political spectrum. We'll go with a very easy one for Democrats and Republicans uh, both. Uh, for Democrats, they are strongly advocating uh, for the Black Lives Matter movement, and for the majority of white people, like my, most white people, I don't think are racist. Um, and so when you tell people that racism is a big problem in the country, uh, most white people look at that and say, I, you know, I don't see it. And that's probably true. They don't see it. But just because they don't see the problem doesn't mean it doesn't exist for people. Okay. Now, let's look on the flip side of that. Let me give you another, uh, another issue here. Uh, for Republicans, one of their big complaints is about the Affordable Care Act. Okay? And the Affordable Care Act helped out a lot of low-income Americans get health insurance. But what happened was the premiums for health insurance for a lot of middle-class folks, uh, the premiums for health insurance, the cost of it, was going up dramatically. And so a lot of middle-income families now are struggling to survive because uh, they don't have the money, that the extra income that they once did. And so they're struggling to make it. And so a lot of people say, hey, the Affordable Care Act affected me positively. And so a lot of conservative folks look at that and say, well, it didn't do that for me. Uh, it didn't help me out at all. And Democrats, you know, a lot of Democrats look at it and say, well, that's not our problem. Well, it kind of is because – uh, if one group of people has a problem in this country, then everyone has an issue. You can't correct a problem or uh, refuse to address an issue simply because it doesn't affect you. All right, And that's one of the biggest problems we have as Americans is that we're very individualistic. All right? And that affects both parties. Anyway, look, we got a test coming up uh, on Monday, and I'll probably leave it open for a day or two uh, to give you time to breathe a little bit. If you have questions, comments, concerns, feel free to shoot them my way on Schoology, guys.